Hi everyone, I, my name is Anahi Ut. I'm currently a postdoctoral research fellow at the Blavatnik School of Government at the University of Oxford. And for the next few minutes, I will be introducing my article, Emotions, International Relations and the Everyday, Individuals Emotional Attachments to International Organizations, uh, which is being published by the Review of International Studies. So over the years, there have been several crises at the international level that have shed some light on individuals' appreciation of or dissatisfaction with international organizations. So we can think, for instance, of negative reactions towards institu institutions like the World Bank or like the IMF during the global financial crisis, of uh, debates about the scope of power of the WHO during the COVID-19 pandemic, or of responses to NATO expansion in the context of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And so, of course, individuals' connection to IOs might not be an immediate concern for most political actors, but what 2016 and the Brexit referendum to leave the European Union show is that individuals' views on international organizations are important for international politics and have to be considered. And so the question behind my article is essentially how can we understand and study individuals' relationship to international organizations? And as the title of my paper will have betrayed by now, my argument is that the answer lies in looking at emotions. And so more precisely in the article, I use emotions to study everyday relations to IOs in two different uh, ways. So the first one is by focusing on everyday emotional attachments to move beyond elite discourse. Um, so emotional, um, emotional research in IR is obviously a growing field um, and the Review of International Studies has published excellent scholarship on the topic. But the engagement with the micro level of ordinary individuals still uh, remains limited. And so by fo focusing on individual emotional attachments, we can get insights into the unique ways in which emotions can be expressed and subsequently become politically significant. But studying individuals requires different uh, methods than studying the macro level. And so for this reason, the second way I use to study emotions is to employ the method of focus groups in order to engage directly with individuals while still retaining the social dimension that is so crucial to emotions. And so before getting into these two aspects, I want to briefly stress why this question of emotions about organizations matters in the first place. Um, and it is fast because it narrows down the alternatives for the future as someone who is uh, positively attached to an organization is unlikely to want to leave it and vice versa. Now, second, it gives insights into how political communication is received, notably the effective narratives employed by IOs to justify their existence or scope of action. And that, as I mentioned, aggregated uh, individuals' emotions ultimately can influence IO spots, like in the case of the EU and uh, Brexit. So as I said, I'm focusing on emotions in the shape of attachments, um, which I define in the article as the con emotional connection, whether conscious or not, that an individual has to an object or a group. Um, so for example, a political entity like an international organization. So attachments can be positive or negative. They are anchored in collective memory or in personal experience. They can be expressed uh, explicitly or implicitly. <clears throat> so by using uh, emotional language to convey emotions rather than disclosing them directly. They are context dependent, so um, attachments to NATO, for instance, might carry more weight in a debate about war than they would in a conversation about um, local elections. Moreover, attachments like uh, any emotions are not strictly individual and are affected by the collective too. So finally, in the specific context of international organizations, they will also vary depending on some of the characteristics of the IO itself. And so here, I think two axes are particularly relevant, uh, proximity and time. So generally, the closer an organization is perceived to be, the likelier attachments are to be high. So proximity can be uh, understood in geographical or spatial terms. Uh, for example, our African Union member states are on the same continent. And it can also be understood in social terms by perceiving some similarities between members, so for example, by sharing ideological viewpoints and viewing members as part of an in-group with a common out-group. Um, so NATO might come to mind here. In contrast, IOs with more diverse members, more diverse interests are less likely to be emotionally appealing. So for example, WHO, WTO, et cetera, which are seen to be um, less exclusive. So proximity can also influence um, when it refers to the closeness of the individual to the IO. So IOs that feel more familiar to individuals are likely to foster more emotional attachments than those that are um, less recognizable and uh, less well known. 
Second, I'm also influences the emotional appeal of an, of an organization, notably because attachments tend to grow over time as a ecological entity becomes more integrated in people's everyday life and imaginary. So this process is, um, however, not linear. Political events that impinge on their scope of influence, their functioning or even their existence are bound to elicit some emotions. And this is the case, uh, notably, when we are thinking about crisis, we can, which can um, activate, challenge, or reinforce attachments. So, for example, attachments to NATO are likely stronger today than they were um, over a year ago before the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And similarly, research and surveys show that public opinion about the EU has um, increased since Brexit. And so the proximity and time aspects of an IO can influence its emotional appeal and thus attachment to it. Now the question is, how do we study these attachments? And in the article, I'm advocating for the use of focus groups, which is a method based on group interaction, which makes it uh, useful to study emotional dynamics. So focus groups occupy sort of a middle ground between ethnography and interviews because they allow us to get insights on individuals' emotions, but without foregoing the interaction aspect. And so while group effects um, can often be a limitation of focus group research due to its uh, encouraging consensus and agreement, I argue that for emotion research, this, this is precisely what makes them interesting because um, especially we, when we consider the sensitive moments, which are moments that are possibly uncomfortable, that are full of tension, um, and that generally make visible the porous and fragile nature of everyday interactions through strong reactions to particular claims. So to put it simply, if we start from the premise that focus groups promote consensus, then the moments when participants risk confrontation um, are because the arguments for which they do hold enough emotional significance for them to do so, and so revealing um, at the same time emotional attachments. So in my analysis, I looked specifically for these sensitive moments, and then I captured their intensity and the nuances of attachments with an analysis of emotional language. For the empirical part of the article, I use the European Union as a case study because it can act as a sort of ideal type that is high on both the proximity and the time axis. So the focus groups were held in four different countries, which were also picked with that in mind. So Belgium, France, Italy and Portugal share similar levels of proximity and have spent a long time within the EU. And so what my empirical findings show is that first, in terms of proximity, the EU was depicted as a close and exclusive community, which a clear in-group and a clear out-group, which was excluding um, non-EU members, especially powerful countries like China or the US, which the EU seemed to be um, in competition with. There was also an insistence on the common values, responsibilities and moral imperatives that come from being part of the in-group and on the importance of abiding by them. Attachments were also reinforced by individuals insisting on their closeness to the EU, notably by talking about the EU as without an imaginable alternative. Um, second, in terms of time now, emotions arise when events impacting the EU are discussed, so attachments were often dis um, disclosed in relation to a um, temporal dimension. Notably, this often took the shape of mentions of World War II, the context of integration, crises like Brexit, or different hypothetical futures. And so in conclusion, uh, emotion, uh, emotional attachments to IOs are important because they narrow down the alternatives for what individuals want or what they are willing to accept for the future of an organization. So positive and strong attachments, for instance, render some options like uh, leaving an organization um, simply unthinkable. Attachments and emotions more generally can be captured through the use of focus groups, uh, which again allows us to account both for the individual emotions, but also for their social dimension by considering the group interactions and the sensitive moments, which are um, not generated by the moderator, but by other participants. Um, now emotions are becoming increasingly crucial when attempting to understand citizens' connections to um, international organizations and how they will shape their future. Um, and as the Russian invasion of Ukraine is bringing back debates around NATO, the question of support for diverse IOs is likely to gain in importance and individuals' everyday emotions about it will certainly uh, come into play as they have shown to become politically significant. So on that note, if you made it this far in the video, I thank you um, very much for your time. And if you are interested in hearing more about my research, you can access the article in the um, review of international studies. So thank you very much.